uh, my, my children are just well, one of them is starting school at the moment. So um, I'm glad to be. Uh, I told them about our little trip to India, and they said that sounded daunting. I said this to me sounds much much simpler than teaching the uh, phonics to the reception kids. But India, I want to remind us why we're going there uh, with a little video clip from Calcutta, from one of the series. It's only a seven-minute clip, and then I'm going to talk us through the various uh, uh, visa aspects. So this is just a um, seven-minute clip from a program on the BBC last year, which highlights, I think, why we're going. It's about a boy from the streets of Calcutta. Come in, Brandon. Most welcome. From the streets of Calcutta, who is just, uh, uh, you know, surviving. And he's not actually, he's not just surviving. He's thriving, even though he lives uh, on some, basically, wasteland. He lives in between the Hooghly River, which is part of the Ganges here in uh, Calcutta, which we'll be going to, obviously. And he lives in between the... the uh, the river and the train track. He's sort of right in the middle of those two. And this guy, you know, and, and students complain so much and, and teachers complain so much and uh, maybe, maybe British society today complains so much and arguably there's plenty of things to complain about. However, um, you know, this guy in these circumstances, this young man, it's very typical of a Bengali young person, <laughs> has that sort of spirit um, of resilience, resourcefulness, creativity, and all those skills that we are trying to teach in schools. It's, they're called the building learning power skills. And that's from year 7 to year 13. This, they just seem to have this naturally. And I, and I can't, uh, I'm ceaselessly amazed by these young people. So let's just watch this little clip. Might have to change the sound of a few bits and pieces. That's not the right bit. <laughs> I, I cut it down, so hopefully it will work. And I have to start again. Technology. Gondal and his best friend Rajesh use the magnets from old speakers for their very own form of drawing. The machine for the music we are chair. It's a child for the machine. I get this chair. I'm going to direct to you. I don't know. It's a hassan cup. It's the river that provides 19-year-old Gandhala and his family with their main income. If you get Gandhala, you get some money for the person. You get a lot of money for the person. Gandal and his entire extended family live on unclaimed land just a couple of hundred meters down the riverbank. Once Kandal's real with enough money to pay the family's food bill for the day, he heads home. Manchester United, 
Um, I think it was six. Just get the lights back on. Okay, so right, that's it. it's a bit bright to see the screen. Sorry about this. I'm not used to. Uh, that's number seven. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is probably the easier thing than randomly pressing. And three, but that has. <coughs> Tell me when you guys can see the screen well. <laughs> you know, if at all. Not there either. Number six. Okay, so if I just turn that off and put the house lights on, maybe this is the best thing to do. Can you see the screen? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that guy, that young man, I don't know, younger than most of your students here, he's out there working and giving half the money to his mother, some proportion to his brother. His brother's the favoured one, which is shocking parenting, obviously. I mean, that's so hurtful. And yet he still wants to make his parents proud. He still wants to fulfill his own dreams. He's volunteering his spare time to coach other underprivileged children. And those are the kind of kids that we'll be working with at Future Home. They're exactly like that. I know because I've worked with them uh, for months and months. Okay, so it's great. It's a great privilege to go and work with them and to be inspired by these young people who can often speak three languages or more. Um, so that's why we're going, guys. That's why we're going. We're not just going on a an amazing expedition, adventure, which we're really going to learn and to share our skills. One of the things coming up, we've got the British Red Cross in January who've agreed to come and do some team building with the students. So with all the 37 students and the, and the four members of staff, we'll be having an afternoon out of lessons or perhaps a morning. Um, and they'll be doing some team building exercises with the group to start to get the group to be a little bit cohesive before we go. So that's something that's definitely been agreed. Another exciting new addition to the trip, which I haven't told you about yet, because uh, I haven't seen you since we had Tim Grandage here, is that Sanjay Patra, the rugby manager uh, at Future Hope, uh, we've managed to co-opt him, so he is going to be travelling with us at every stage. So from, from the moment we arrive in Calcutta, he'll be with us. And all, uh, throughout our travels up into the mountains and across Agra and finally to Chennai, he's travelling the whole journey with us as a bit of a, a cultural attaché, if you like, which is really handy to have. In addition to the tour-provided you know, guides, we've got tour-provided guides at every stage, but better than that, this is a guy okay, from Future Hope. He was one of the boys, if you were here last time with Mr Tim Grandage, he was one of the little street boys in, in those first black and white images uh, that he showed you. So he's come through Future Hope. Uh, he's, um, he has uh, worked at um, rugby school. Uh, in, uh, so he came to England to work at rugby school. Also, um, the other thing about Sanjay is when I worked in Calcutta, we, taught, we brought a trip of Future Hope boys, the rugby players, to England to play in the under-16s Roslyn Park National School 7s rugby tournament. So he's done international trips with me as well, with students in a, in, a, in a teaching capacity. As I said, he's worked at one of the top public schools in England as well. He's married and has a child of his own. You can see in the bottom left there, it's not very clear. Like myself, he has a young family now. He has full independence, economic independence, has his own house. And that's what Future Hope does. And I thought it was so nice as we're going out to work with Future Hope that um, he can come and work with us. So I've also toured around India with Sanjay taking Future Hope students as well. That's Sanjay there with uh, the Calcutta Cup, because of course the original Calcutta Cup that they play for every, every Six Nations uh, is actually, or, or between, yeah, Scotland uh, and, uh, sorry, within the, Six Nation, within the Six Nations, when Scotland and England play, they play the Cup. It was made from melted down rupees, which were originally, of course, made out of silver. And so when I was out there, we used to train the Calcutta Cricket Club and Rugby Club and we used to play in this big tournament, and it's called the Calcutta Cup, and of course they made two trophies at the time, one in India and one we sent to the UK. So the same trophy made out of the original ru silver rupees, which is great. So there's Tim Grandage, you've met him now, who's looking forward to receiving us 
when we arrive in Calcutta and uh, supporting us as we work with the, with the Future Hope students. So on to the business of the visa. There's my visa, bad photo. Looks like I've got a November moustache on <laughs> there. Like Mr. Foster doing a great job. Um, that or sort of Poirot or something, I'm not quite sure what it is, but never mind. Um, I've had my visa, I mean, this is my third Indian visa, and they are, they are troublesome to get hold of. Not so much for adults, but more tricky for students. You won't get all of this, you will not get all of this now, but the video plus the steps I'm going to share with you, you'll have a chance to hopefully recap. And, so don't worry that you get it all, you won't get it all in this one, one session. Okay, I'm just giving you an overview, really. The Indians love red, uh, red tape, as you know, bureaucracy. And uh, that goes for the Indians who work here in the, in the UK uh, with, within the sort of visa application system. So there's a bit of a checklist of stuff. So it's very different. I mean, it's tricky for me, I, I hope they don't mind me telling them, both Sir, all three of my colleagues, Sir Christopher Stone, who's tonight having his uh, inoculations and jabs, by the way, uh, Mrs. Lucy Mead and Mr. Stuart Foster have, have all made slight errors on their application process. And they're doing it the easier way as an adult. Okay? And when I did mine, even though I've done it twice before, um, the actual Indian sort of a consulate website was kind of crashing, and sometimes the dates don't work properly. This is very typical uh, preparation for what life is, is like in India. It doesn't work on the same basis uh, as we are used to. Okay, so it's a real cultural change. So the first thing you're going to have to do with a visa application for your child, your son or daughter, one of the things that we absolutely prerequisite is to fill out this visa application form. It's an online form. Okay? So you have to, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. You bring it up onto online, you fill it out online, you can save at any point, you can return to it. When you finish, you can save a copy. Uh, I've got a copy of mine here, I'll show you in a moment. So your first thing you know you need to, to do will be to complete uh, fully the visa online application. Along with that, you'll need uh, two two-inch by two-inch photographs. And so that isn't a standard passport size. So most photo booths do offer that as an option, okay, and, and certainly uh, photo shops can produce those for you in that unusual measurement, okay? Um, now, there are a myriad of ways to get your visa. You can use the consulate service postal option, and if you do that, that won't make sense to you at the moment, don't worry, it will come together at the end. You would have to, when you're filling out this form, um, at the starting of the process, when it says what jurisdiction are you going to be applying within, if you're doing anything by post, it will be you have to actually put down by lo the London mission. Okay? But if, like me, you went in, you're going to go in, uh, you go in person, uh, you have to then put down with, on, on that form, on that process, that it is Birmingham uh, is the jurisdiction for your visa application. If your child is under 16 at the time of applying for the visa, both parents and the child will need to sign the um, online application form. Um, if your child, um, yeah, sorry, what was that? Under 16, uh, recap on this. Yeah, if the child has their own signature, both parents and the child must sign. But if the child doesn't have their own signature on their passport, then only the parents sign. But actually, if all three of you sign, or what have you, that, that's the best option. Also, the declaration form is a prerequisite form at the time of making or submitting your application. Again, both must be signed, both parents must sign that for under 16s there. So what else would you need to do? In addition to the online application, to the declaration, declaration form, you also need a letter uh, from us. Now, Mrs. Me, Mr. Foster and uh, Sir Christopher Stones Visas are in the process of being sent back to them, having done the process. So they'll be with us in the next day or two. I will need to scan those in, I've uh, scanned mine in, along with my passport and all those colleagues' passports. And we'll need to put those into a letter for you, which will say that we are accepting responsibility for your children during the trip. So that's our side acknowledging that we are responsible. 
All these measures I'm about to show you are because, unfortunately, um, some people have been taking children to Asia and having forced weddings and, and dumping them there and not, never returning. So you, you signing your, student, your, your children off to us, we're acknowledging that you know, we are responsible for them and we are going to be bringing them back and we're not going to force them to get married and to, to stay in India, okay? Definitely, that's not going to happen. All right. um, you have to do the same. You have to prepare a consent form and I will give you a, uh, a mock example that you just tweak slightly, okay? Um, a parental, that isn't a, a real parental consent of the type I'm going to do for you, but just so you know, they'll have to also do a, a parental consent to say that you are happy for all us uh, four members of staff to be, uh, along with Sanjay and additional members of staff, to be uh, supervising uh, your children and looking after them during the 10 days stay. For all those children under 16, again, you also need to have copies of both parents' passports, okay? Uh, photo, photocopies, so obviously clearly not originals, unless you went on the day you could take the originals, but you need to have copies as well as those. Um, unbelievably, they're so thorough now, they're so worried about the issue, also the parents will need to bring, for under 16s, copies of their marriage certificates. Some of you are thinking, crikey, I have no idea what that is. It was 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, I've been married six years uh, soon, but I do know where mine is actually, but I didn't need it, because I'm not under 16. Um, also, you need to bring a copy of the child's original full birth certificate. So a copy of it, but it has to be the full one, not the, the copy, because you know you can get two, can't you? So you have to have the original. It seems a lot, but they need to know that the child we're taking, you know, we are responsible and you are happy for them to be going. So, some more complexities for you. If in case of a divorce, you need a child custody letter from a court saying who's responsible for that child. And in the case of a single parent, a solicitor's letter or, and a council benefit letter is required as well. You know, the Indians are sticklers for the red tape. And it is, it is not easy. Okay, it's not an easy process. Now, you're not going to get all that in one go. And by the way, we haven't finished. There's more to it than that. Um, like I said, three highly educated people made small mishaps on the forms. I'm going to go back to the form now. When I send you out this pack of information, both electronically and paper versions, will probably be the end of next week, um, I'm going to give you a copy of my completed application here. I'm going to blank out the bits that wouldn't be relevant to you and leave in the bits that you could just duplicate. Okay, so if we just have a quick scan through this briefly together now, perhaps if I make it slightly larger, it might be easier to see, but we need to sort of not make it too large, so we, I can't read it either. Okay, so obviously you've got the passport, the, the photographs there of those two inch by two inch, unusual size. Surname, should be no problems. Four names, as in the passport, fine. Gender, no problems. Date of birth, um, place of birth. National ID number, we don't have national ID numbers. Educational qualification, I guess you might, some of you might put GCSEs down. I uh, don't know how much you're going to be doing there. Um, I hope you don't have too many surgical scars like I do in terms of visible identification marks. I don't want to hear about too many tattoos, complete arms and all the rest of it. But no, you fill in this obviously quite easy at first. Nationality, instead of British, you have to, it just doesn't give you that option. It says UK. Your passport number place of issue of the passport, I mean I sent mine off, so I didn't, I didn't know what they were talking about really. I mean it was issued by the passport office or the government, but I mean I did it at Selly Oak Post Office and I paid them some money and got sent off. I'm sure you did something similar, so that wasn't refused, so anything like that would be probably fine. Do I have any other passports or identities? No, and hopefully you won't either. Your children won't. Then your address, telephone numbers, all the rest of it. Family details, you've got to put the parents, the mothers, None of you are married. Um, and then the type of visa. It's a tourist visa. I mean, I'll leave that bit in there for it's a multiple entry visa. You have to, don't ask me why. We're not going multiple times to India, but that's what you need to do. Six months, um, start date would be the same. Arriving in Kolkata and leaving through Chennai. So they're fine. I'll leave all the relevant bits in. Where we're staying, the purpose of it, I just put down tourism just for ease. Uh, whether you stayed in India or not before. If you haven't been to India before, you just the student will just leave that bit blank in terms of where you've been in the last 10 years. 
Um, have you ever been refused an Indian visa? No. And then any roles uh, and what have you. Now in terms of uh, referees at the bottom here, references, you have to have an Indian reference there which is well leave in place and I also recommend that we will use Sir Christopher Stone as our UK based reference. Okay, so keep that as well. Now that doesn't look too bad. But actually, each one of those questions is on an online form, which is quite niggly. And the dates, it took me about two hours in between putting my children to bed and getting my, the fire going uh, for my wife during half term to make sure the dates were correct. Because I kept pressing, you know they have those options, those calendar options, and you click on May or June, you try and cycle across to 2011 and change the dates with a few clicks. It just wasn't happening for me. So I couldn't get the dates. So there will be niggly things like that. And then after that, once you've completed the form and you've pre-printed your declaration form off and pre-signed that, you can then make an appointment, uh, as I'm going to come to in a moment. Now, when I tried to make an appointment, that system also broke down on me. So there are little snags. But don't worry, I have solutions for you to, to, to make it a lot easier, as I'm going to share in a minute. Okay, so just close that down. So... Since I first uh, went to uh, India, they've changed the uh, system. You used to go to the jewellery quarter to get your Indian visa, as some of you, uh, some of the adults here may have done in the past. Okay, but now they've outsourced their visa process to a company called VFS Global. And this is their website. And as I said, there's two real main ways um, of getting your visa. Okay, so you can either... Uh, do your visa in person or by post. Now, this is the problem. If you make a small mistake on your application form, something is not quite right, you haven't quite got the right forms with you, the documentation, and you make an appointment, I don't know, for two weeks' time, you take your daughter or son out, out of school for an hour perhaps to do that. I wouldn't recommend that, by the way, because... The, I've spoken to them, the Christmas holidays is still ample, ample time to do that, more than ample time. It just takes one week to get it returned to you. Okay. Um, but if you did go then the Christmas holidays and you thought you had everything with you, and they say, I'm sorry sir, this isn't correct, and then you'd, you'd have to remake another point. But you couldn't say, can I just have a blank form? Can I just rewrite it out? I'm afraid not sir, there's many people here. And they'd smile at you and do this with their head. And you'd have to go home. And then you'd have to redo the form. And then you'd have to rebook another appointment. And it can be tricky. Worse. Worse than that. At least if you do that, you know you've made a mistake. Um, and you know what to do. If you send it by post, they'll just send it back to you saying it's incorrect. And you have to start again that way as well. And you've incurred the cost of signed for, not signed for by the way. Don't do signed for. Did you know? I didn't know this. Signed for delivery is not a reported service. They managed, my, my solicitors, I'm moving house at the moment, lost my, my, my wife's passports by sending it from Sutton Coldfield, I have a local solicitor, in the post by sign for. And it, it disapp they disappeared in, uh, in Birmingham. It, you know, it's a disaster. So you must send them recorded delivery or special delivery, the only two ways. So sign for, although they, they sign for it, is not recorded. They don't track it at every stage. No, well, I, I didn't. I didn't. The solicitor did. I had words with him. And, uh, and I asked him to speed up my conveyancing. Uh, and uh, hopefully you will do. Anyhow, um, so there's the two options. You can do it with all that information, sending all that documentation in the post through the VSF website to the London Mission. I wouldn't recommend that option. Okay. You could do what I did. Oh, I, by the way, didn't make an appointment. I just went first thing in the morning. At 8.30 in the half term, dashed in, got the kids up, got in the car, zoomed in. You can't park there, by the way. Really inconvenient. Hopefully you know the Botanical Gardens in Birmingham. <laughs> it's very close to the Botanical Gardens. I'm going to click on here, take you to a Google uh, Earth, zoom in. And you can see exactly, I'll show you exactly where it is. But if you know where the Botanical Gardens, of course, is, well, the Botanical Gardens is basically the end of Vicarage Road down here. It's a one-way system as well, so it can be quite tricky to get to. You're not allowed to park anywhere near it, so I had to park about a mile away and run uh, with all my forms and passports and the rest of it, hoping not to inconvenience my wife for too long with our four little children, and uh, got it done. Uh, luckily, I got it all correct. And it's actually just down that road there. See that little side road? And it's still snuck in there, 
So that is one of the options you can do. You can, you can go and be the first thing in the morning and have to wait about an hour or two, or you can make an appointment. But either way, if you haven't done it properly, you have to go home again. And, 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 it's, and, and you haven't got the time, I should imagine. I mean, I don't have the time. I'm sure you don't have the time. So I've got a recommendation for you. It will cost you £42 extra, but this is what Sir Christopher Stone has done. This is what Mrs. Lucy Mead has done. This is what Mr. Stuart Foster has done. They've used Scott's visa. Well, my brother did. He's got more money than me. And uh, whereas I'm, you know, my four little babies and keeping the heating off, I thought I'm going to save that 40 quid. And I just managed to sort it out. But it was tricky. It is tricky. If you use Scott's service, they will, you will still have to fit it for the London mission. Uh, and it will go via post. All you'll have to do is get your documentation together. You'll send it to them in the post by recorded delivery, a special delivery, either of those two things. And then they'll check your application for you. And if there's any errors, at that point, before they send it off, they'll say, look, hey, you just missed this one thing. That one thing isn't quite right. And then they'll contact you and get you to send them that before they send it off. They then will get sent back to you by courier delivery, back to you um, in your house. Now, you don't need 48 hour service because there's no, there's no rush. So it's a £42 surcharge, and they'll just take all the hassle away from you. So all three of my colleagues who make small errors, Scott's are able to say, I'm really sorry, you just missed this last thing. And it's, not, it's just because we're rushing, there's lots to do, you know, the red tape. And I just think it's really brilliant. If you want to spend a long time getting it right the first time, but maybe making a small error, okay, fine. Um, but you might have to go back a couple of times. But if you use this service, they'll help you iron it out. They'll talk you through it again over the telephone. So I've been in touch with them, uh, and I think some will go for this and some won't. I'm not on any kind of commission, uh, I can assure you. Uh, I, should have, I should have talked about that. But uh, her name is Anastasia. I won't pronounce her surname, but she is from Cyprus originally. And she's a senior visa consultant there. And you can email her, you can call her. She's happy to talk you through it, the process again, with all those different uh, stages. I'm going to give you, of course, all those pieces of paper at first. So I would hold back from doing anything until I give you the packs of the consent letters, the model consent letters that you would adapt. We'll send you electronic versions and paper versions with the checklist so you're more prepared. She said, oh, parents will get it wrong every time. I said, well, they haven't been to my session. <laughs> and so uh, hopefully you've at least got a heads up of what's involved. And that service um, is really supportive. I think Mrs. Mead and Mr. Foster will I had a good experience. I spoke to a chap called Bruno Farage, and they actually uh, do online web chats as well. Uh, so you don't actually have to pick up a phone at all. And he answered all my questions. Um, I chose the wrong mission, so straight away I got an email. Um, I sent it off the very next day. Uh, and they'll ring you to confirm they've received it um, when it's been sent off. And they don't actually take any payment until the visa's been approved, which is another good thing as well. So, I mean, it's a £35 handling fee. £7 of that £42 is VAT. Of course, you're also having to pay for your, sending your stuff to them to London in the first place, plus the courier service fee. But remember, even if you went in person, unless you want to go back in person to collect your visa, park your car a mile away, walk to the actual site and recollect it, which is a real hassle, because only at certain times of the day you're allowed to collect them, you have to pay for that courier service back. So even though I went there in person in Birmingham, I had to pay for the courier delivery back. Okay, so there's no difference on that anyway. So it really is only £42 difference to make your lives much smoother. They fully support you. That's their full-time job. Their full-time job is to get people supported through the visa application process. So they're, they're highly specialists. And as I said, my colleagues chose to use them. I did the slightly more you know, challenging way. Um, but either way, uh, that's really what's involved. You know, it's, uh, it's, a bit fi it's a bit fiddly, and even the web website is a little bit fiddly at, at times. But persevere, we'll send you the video, we'll send you the pack. It's up to you again to make your own decision on how you want to do that. I'm now going to hand you over to uh, Mrs. Lucy Mee, uh, who's on the trip, and our senior administrator at the school. And she's going to talk just a tiny bit, a little bit about um, some first aid qualification that she's, she's currently um, refreshing and taking again, and also a little bit about the inoculations and things like that. <coughs> Thank you, Lucy. Do you want to have a quick look at that? Um, yeah, I think it's just important that you know that there will be a first aid trained member of staff on the trip, and that will be me. And I haven't done first aid for a long time. 
Um, so I'll be going on a full course for that. So that's in January, so it'll all be really fresh in my mind. I know that Mrs. Zarife has had a lot of queries about inoculations, and I think the advice that Mrs. Zarife has given really is that you take the advice from your GP, which is what I've done. Um, the vaccinations that I've chosen to have done were quite extensive, um, and I've chosen to have cholera, but in some cases, you know, for instance, Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, Foster has gone back to have a consultation with his GP about that. I noticed somebody was washing their teeth in the Ganges um, on that video. Um, and that, you, you know, potentially, if you're going to wash your teeth in the Ganges, you're likely to pick up cholera, and we're not planning to do that. You know, and all the personal hygiene and all those sorts of things, you know, will be recommending that people are, you know, extra careful about, you know, how they take care of themselves in terms of washing their hands and things like that. Cholera is not something, I think, that is, is generally recommended, but I've weighed up the risks personally and have made a decision to have it. But, again, you need to talk to your GP about that and decide which ones you're going to have. So, although the list has gone out, I think, make sure that you get the information from your GP and, um, you know, weigh up the risks and decide which ones you want to have. And, by the way, none of them have given me any side effects whatsoever, though I haven't had typhoid, and I can say, having just had a conversation with me, you, that you made uh, Will at the front here feel a bit Whoa. fuzzy. <laughs> so, but I've had almost all of them now, um, and I haven't had any side effects at all. So, and I've gone and had them at lunchtime and come back to work. Just a quick question. Um, just a bit of uh, debate about whether to have rabies or not. How, how That's just what I was going to ask. Did you have rabies? I'm not, I'm not having rabies. No. no. The, the, the advice that was given to me um, was that the rabies vaccination just buys you time. Yeah. So if you were to go somewhere very remote for a long time, you might think, actually, rabies is something that I need because it's going to buy you time. My nurse couldn't tell me um, how much time it would buy me. She said, I don't know. So, you know, we, we are in urban areas much of the time. You know, we're not going to be away from anywhere where we can't get medical attention. And if you were bitten by an animal anyway, you'd have to seek medical attention. So you wouldn't, you know, even if you had the, uh, were bitten by anything, you hadn't had a rabies vaccination, even if you had had the rabies vaccination, you would have to go and consult, you know, mm -hmm. get medical help anyway. You wouldn't just ignore it. And another thing was the TB. It's very hard to get. Is there any new form that do that? I've actually called them. Okay, I, I, haven't been, I haven't been recommended to have TB, but if that's what it's you're... It's really hard to get in Birmingham, <laughs> Um, I mean, the thing is to shop around a bit, because that's the other thing. Some private um, clinics, obviously, will uh, charge more than others. Um, you know, I've been talking to some parents at the front here who have, um, you know, opted to have, you know, a certain vaccination which you have to pay for, um, and, you know, some places are going to offer that, you know, a a, at a better cost than others, for instance. So, again, shop around. I think there's a travel clinic in Birmingham mm. in Superdrug, so if you wanted to go there, there's also one up at Bash Furlong. If anyone knows the surgery for Bash Furlong, there's a private clinic up there. You can also get in boots. So it is about sort of shopping around, really, and also taking the advice from your GP and then making a decision about which vaccinations you're going to decide to have. There is a combined, if you're under 16, which you get free, hepatitis and tuberculosis, called Hippox. Yeah. And it's free. In front of all, of, all of what I've had uh, have been free so far. Collar yeah. you have to pay for. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm choosing to have collar personally. Uh, not everybody is, is going to choose to have that, but I am. Um, and I've also chosen to have Japanese encephalitis. But again, that's a personal choice. But not everybody's necessarily going to want to have that. So it is about.